Hello everyone and welcome to another I Work in Sports live interview. Uh, this, show, this is a show where we bring accomplished sport business professionals uh, to come here and share their knowledge, their tips and advice to help you succeed or improve at least in your career. Today we have a very, very special guest. We'll introduce you just um, in a minute. Uh, for the moment, I can see that there are already some people sending comments here from India, from uh, Brazil, from Lausanne here in Switzerland. Thank you so much, Riju. Already uh, shared, have you, I'll, I'll get your question uh, very, very soon. Dresh, um, Erica, Lee Carelli. Thank you, everyone that is um, watching uh, at the moment. Uh, before I go to the uh, our our guest, actually, let me introduce myself because if, if it's your first time here, uh, my name is Jean Frigerio. I'm the founder of uh, I Work in Sport. So I Work in Sport actually was created as a an, an event as a job fair. Now we um, we've grown. We have uh, two other two digital events. And our mission is really to try to connect talent and the, and the recruiters, as well as support uh, ac academia, education, and career growth, really, for people that are wanting to develop in their career. So today, uh, this is, if you, if you want to check more, this is uh, iworkinsport.com. Uh, go and visit that. Oh, and by the way, if you want to support the channel, I cannot forget to ask you that. Uh, subscribe and hit the bell to get notified whenever we have new interviews coming. Now, today, uh, it's a very special guest to me. Uh, actually, every guest, in a way, is, is special. Uh, Daniel uh, G is a sports and entertainment lawyer, is a author of a book called Done Deal. And fun fact, we never met uh, before we probably we have many contacts so sort of in common but i think this is also an example of how people can build uh we can talk a little uh, a bit more about that uh, later on in in, in the talk in, in the interview but um you know i he's well-known lawyer in the industry um i saw a series of videos that he did in career uh, in sport I have, I think, the link in the description. If it's not here, we'll be right after the, the live. And I recommend you look at all those videos. But I, seeing that, thought that um, you guys, the audience uh, that come to I Work and Sport would be interested in it. So I invited him to come and join and participate with us. So without further ado, ado let me... Uh, get uh daniel in the screen daniel can you hear me are you all right i can i can can you hear me okay yeah yeah great listen thank you very much uh for being here for for doing this it was a pleasure to talk to you as i said for the first time just um uh, two days ago and um it would be nice to i, I will actually share a bit of the process of how we, we brought you in the show um later on but i will actually start asking you to tell us a bit about uh, yourself, your career, you're an accomplished uh, sports lawyer. Well, you're a lawyer now uh, working uh, mainly in football. Would be nice if you gave us, you know, a short uh, story of how you actually got to do what you do and what you're doing now exactly. For sure, Joel, thank you very much for, for having me on. I think, um, yeah, really appreciate the introduction. Really appreciate the chance just to to chat to you generally. I'm I'm delighted we're both um, guitar fans. I both see guitars in our backgrounds. I hope you've been playing as much as I've tried to play over the last few months. Um, yeah. So by way of brief background, I mean, uh, if I if I start with the present, which is I'm a uh, sports uh, lawyer at a firm called Sheridan's. I tend to work within uh, the, the international football industry, specifically in um, the UK, dealing with um, Premier League clients. Usually I work with a variety of agents uh, and players uh, in relation to uh, transfers, contract renegotiations, boot deals, endorsement deals, ambassador and commercial related matters. The variety of disputes that tend to arise uh, in lots of industries, but football specifically. 
um, and all of the reputation management issues that arise in compliance. So, you know, I, I call myself a football lawyer, but a lot of the time I'm a, a contracts lawyer, I'm a disputes lawyer, I'm a reputation management lawyer, I'm a regulatory lawyer, um, so, and I'm an intellectual property lawyer. So, you know, that bit doesn't quite sound as sexy as a, a football lawyer, but they are the type of things um, that I, they do day to day. And by way of brief background, at least, I, um, you know, I, I've always been a football fan and a sports fan, just as yourself and, and many others um, that have wanted to get into the industry. And, you know, I started doing an undergraduate law degree a while back now when I had a bit more hair back in uh, 1999. Um, and from there, I did a master's in uh, football broadcasting rights. Um, I then joined an American law firm doing a variety of different work, um, not necessarily in sport for quite some time. And we can talk on this at length. But my journey really wasn't necessarily uh, plain sailing. It wasn't necessarily just in sport. Far from it. I actually built my most of my skills and my knowledge base in law outside of the um, sports sphere to a degree over the last um 16 years now or so um and um you know a lot of the things you mentioned the, the youtube videos i've done a few of a lot of the things that i try and emphasize um are things like you know don't worry about the short-term aims of trying to get into the industry and um, we can talk about that at length at the same time but a lot of people that i speak to and Joe, i'm sure it's the same way you speak to them as well especially from your career side is you know, everyone feels like they're in a hurry. Um, and sometimes the timing of jobs, of applications, of timing, of coincidence, of opportunity doesn't always usually arise at exactly the same moment that you ideally want it. But a lot yeah. of the time, uh, what we actually need to be trying to do is find the right time, make the right time for yourself. And in the meantime, build up all of those core competencies that I'm sure we'll talk about too. Yeah, no, th that's great. That is definitely one of the main takeaways from the series of, uh, of videos uh, that, that you have that I recommend that um, everybody watch. Um, as you said, we'll, we'll talk a, a little bit uh, more about that. If you if you want actually just also to, to have a word about uh, Sheridan's, um, uh, Sheridan's in, in a bit more detail, and then we, we talk about those takeaways of, of those presentations and actually what prompt which was what prompted me to invite you to, to participate in this talk. Yeah, yeah, of course, that'd be great. So yeah, Sheridan's is um, um, a London-centric law firm um, and deals in the, the entertainment um, industry. So, um, you know, we've been built around the, the sexier areas of law, which is theatre, music, film and television, computer games, esports now, um, sport, um, and, and effectively, I've been lucky enough over the last uh, over five years now to be working at Sheridan specifically in, um, in the sports team, sports and esports team. Um, and we do a huge amount of work across the, the sports ecosystem uh, for rights holders, leagues, associations, um, tech companies, data companies, whatever else, um, you know, a, a huge amount of um, clients in the um, in the sports football and wider sports space. So I'm lucky enough to work with a great team of lawyers. Um, you know, it sounds a bit trite, but the, the truth is, is that I really enjoy. Whilst when I was going into the office, I really enjoyed going into the office. Um, yeah. Now, you know, being at home, um, it sort of almost emphasizes or re-emphasizes. Um, you know how you know the enjoyment I get from the work that I do it doesn't mean it's not stressful. Doesn't mean it's sometimes quite difficult. Doesn't necessarily mean that you enjoy it every second. But um, uh, the my, my general approach is I'm really doing something that I think um, I, I'm good at. I can get a lot better at still, um, but something where I can add real value to, to to my clients and hopefully share a bit of knowledge at the same time. Yeah, great. So going back to that point, which may be a little counterintuitive to whoever's um, listening to us, the, I, the point that you may probably stress the most in, in that series is you really want to work in sport, you have a passion uh, about working in sport. You almost, you don't say exactly like that, but what I feel is almost like advice, don't do it right away, do something different uh, beforehand. Why do you say that exactly? Can, yeah. I almost think that a lot of people that want to work in sport too much put too much pressure on themselves to work in sport straight away. And that's what I certainly did when I was applying for jobs a while back as well. Um, I only wanted to work in sports law firms. I didn't want to think about, you know, other wider ideas, wider sectors. 
uh, to get expertise and competence and um, better experience generally. And I think there's a lot of pressure that people put on themselves, especially when they're coming out of uni or within a certain amount of time to be like, right, well, I need to get a job in sports now. And if I don't get the job in sports now, then I'm a failure. It's not for me. And I'm obviously not good enough for the sector or the sector doesn't appreciate me. And I can't understand why uh, that's the case or not. And my view, in a way, is hopefully counterintuitive, but actually quite um, liberating as well, which is, don't worry about the short term, because if ultimately your long term aim is to work in sport, whatever sport it might be, football, basketball, rugby, tennis, and you know, whatever sport it might be, um, you're in a really strong position because you've already you already know to a degree what your passion is, what you're interested in investing in. Um, and um, you effectively then can work through the stages that you need to work through. Because if you, you know, if you want to go into marketing or social media or comms or, you know, accountancy or law, whatever, whatever the broad range of particular areas in sport that you want to actually concentrate on in time, the great thing is, is that you need an under, underlying core skill set. And it's not good enough just to say, I really love sport uh, and therefore I want to work in sport. It's almost in my mind the reverse. It's the what area of industry do you want to work in? And then how do you attune those skills into a particular sector like sport? And therefore, what happens as a result is that, let's just say you want to be uh, in, in, a, in a big marketing um, role in a rights holder for, for a sports organization. The short term, although you might want to be in that organization straight away, the short term position is, there are tons of marketing agencies out there. There are tons of companies that require marketing executives. Just because that role, the ideal role at a, um, uh, at a junior level doesn't necessarily arise in the short term, doesn't mean for whatever reason, timing, economy, um, the role or skills that you may have at the time, doesn't mean you should forget about working in the sports industry. It's the exact opposite. Go and have experience in other sectors, develop expertise, knowledge, skills, man management skills, client management skills, networking abilities, how to build relationships. And all of those skills will be transferable into a role which effectively is the same role, but in sport. And the other bit that also obviously becomes very key is if you've got that passion for sport, you're constantly reading about it. You're constantly trying to keep up to date with the industry. You're speaking to people about things because you're interested in it. You're engaged that that information becomes stickier, you remember it more, you link things together. So in a way, um, most people who think, I don't want to work in sport, are already at a distinct advantage. They know what they're passionate about. They know and they're happy to invest more time in the process because they're enjoying it. And as a result, you don't need to worry about the short term because you never know where that path may take you. It could take you one side for four or five years, for me, I wasn't doing exclusively sports work for uh, seven or eight years, but yeah. then when I did move into it, and I'm doing it constantly now over the last seven or eight years, um, my previous period of time has held me in fantastic stead. Yeah, yeah. I think that's great advice, um, actually. And, um, well, bef before I go to a few other questions, it's nice to point out that we've been uh, watched in India, uh, in Pakistan, uh, eclipse tra trading from from Pakistan, from Madrid, uh, in Brazil, from Colombia, Bogota. So thank you for uh, uh, living where where you're from there. Also, leave your questions to Daniel. We're gonna get to that in in a bit. But Daniel, before we we get to that, so you had a series of five episodes, each one about thirty minutes. What you do is you talk about uh, each topic about fifteen minutes or so. And then you do some, some Q&As. I recommend that uh, people go and look at that in full. But what I will try to do now very quickly uh, is try to condense uh, a bit of, you know, some of the main takeaways of, of, of that series. So the titles of, of your videos were you started with building relationships, uh, strong one. Then you talk about visualizing your network and developing relationships, uh, supercharge your knowledge base. Then there's one called process, 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 which I suppose that's very important. And, and then there's one about opportunity with preparation. Oops, sorry, <laughs> uh, I dropped something. And um, we're gonna talk about the, 
those. Yeah. So the, the main, let's say, takeaway about building relationships and um, what could you talk about that? I think this, in a way, is, a, is an example of how uh, a way to work it. In, in a way, watching your video and things you said that actually also encouraged me to just reach out to you because, I mean, this is actually what uh, he's telling people to do. Of course, you must have some substance, some preparation. Uh, I came to you with a, a clear offer, and I think uh, hopefully this will be uh, cool for, for both of us. But tell me about that, about um, building a relationship uh, quickly. Yeah, I mean, try and do it in 30, 60 seconds quickly. I mean, the short answer is um, it's, it's difficult and very easy to build relationships. Um, it's difficult because the opportunities are actually endless and it's easy because the opportunities are endless. Um, it could be on LinkedIn, it could be from an article that you've read, it could be from talking to someone in a taxi, it could be from going to a conference and meeting somebody. You know, I think a lot of people, a lot of people that I've learned the best and the most from is people just being open to having conversations. And then you never know where opportunities can arise. So the, the first thing I always say is if you're at a conference, if you have an unsolicited email that you receive, um, if you know, you're in a taxi, if you are chatting to a family member, if you are waiting for an introduction for something or somebody, in a way, the, the, the first chat, the first discussion isn't necessarily the hardest thing. It's the second thing that I mentioned, I think on the second or third day, which is you know, developing relationships and yeah. developing and making those relationships longer term is actually the very, very difficult thing. And briefly, you know, that turns into day two where I've actually spent probably the vast majority of my time and planning time, which is identifying your network, visualizing that network, visualizing that spider's web of contacts across lots of different sectors, across lots of different rights holders and stakeholders inside and outside the sport, and then building up a plan and a process to keep in touch with people to say interesting things, to offer interesting insights, to provide, you know, that flexibility. And, and that becomes very important. Yeah, I mean, one, uh, I think, uh, cool advice that um, you gave there, I normally say uh, the same thing as well whenever you're approaching someone. Uh, a lot of people go with the mindset of asking, you know, how that person may be able to help you. But I think probably the best way to do that is actually try to find a way where you can somehow be, be helpful and think of what you can offer. That was um, one of the major takeaways of, of those uh, first episodes, wasn't it? It's, it's absolutely vital for people to pivot away from the usual narrative of what can the other person do for me, rather what can I can do for them. And the truth is it's a very, very difficult thing to get right because it takes thinking. It doesn't take thinking to write an email saying, dear sir, please give me some work experience because you haven't personalized it. You haven't given it thought. You're just throwing a net around the sea and hoping that one fish, you can catch one fish. Whereas mm -hmm. my approach generally tends to be when I'm giving, trying to give you know, career advice. And that's one of the reasons I did the YouTube clips is, and, and I've, to, to everyone's credit, I've seen it a lot more, more recently, maybe because people have read, watched some of them, the videos, and have been trying to think long and hard about how best to connect with me or people that I work with or people associated in various networks, which is think about what you can offer me. And I don't mean it in a selfish way, but I mean in, in terms of let you need to show somebody um, why you're of value, what you can add a value to potentially somebody who is time poor that has a lot of things going on that will ideally be very nice generally but won't be able to respond to every email saying please can i have some career advice please can i have some mentoring please can i have some work experience there needs to be a hook a catch thinking you know what when i read an email that person's really thought very hard about how they can be of benefit and a thinking outside of the box. And it's all of those type of characteristics, creativity, inquisitiveness, thinking long of hard, preparation, all of those type of things then come out to the fore very quickly. And that's usually what separates a lot of people, some people from a lot of people. Okay, um, to totally agree. On the supercharge your knowledge base, 
you talk about, I think, um, what was that, um, a routine to consume content, five a day or something, if you can expand on that. And before I actually you answer that, I'm actually going to ask people that are watching if they are lawyers watching us as well. Because if there is, we might uh, ask you one or two law-related uh, questions as well, not only about career, but it really depends on, on, on the audience. Uh, but yeah, about the um, routine that uh, you recommend someone create. Yeah, I th again, the, the, the basic premise really is, is that without realizing it for quite a long time, you know, I'm probably a little bit addicted to Twitter and my phone. My wife definitely tells me about that as much. I'm trying to be a bit less so. But the reason why it's important to note is what I've, I realize I've done for a significant period of time is try and curate in different ways, however it is, for you to be able to um, read content sorry read or consume content it may be five articles about the sports industry it might be about law it might be about marketing it might be about comms it might be about social media it might be about you know a vast array of areas you know graphic design whatever else it might be so that what happens in time is that you do one of two things firstly you're building your own knowledge base and i would sort of recommend it as a brief thing to consider you know, thinking about buying a knowledge journal or a journal and just writing down constantly the things that you're reading every day. And it's great because actually I've seen quite a lot of people come back to me on LinkedIn or on WhatsApp or get in touch and go, you know, day 17 of my knowledge journal, I've read all of these articles. It's been fantastic. I'm building my knowledge. I'm going back to things. Things are connecting up, etc. And, you know, from getting into that routine of daily content consumption, whatever it might be, a video, a TED talk, you know, um, uh, an article, a podcast, uh, audio book, because what then happens is, because it's a double benefit, is you start building your knowledge web and things start interlinking, things start connecting. But what also happens is, talking about building and establishing and renewing relationships, it means then that when you are in a position to talk to people, you can start saying interesting things about the industry or at least asking interesting questions about the industry. I read this article, I watched this po I watched this video, I saw that post on Twitter saying this, what do you think about it? And what it establishes is a degree of credibility, a degree of investment into the industry, a degree of investing into yourself so that people can understand and recognize that you don't doesn't mean you have to be an expert at something but it means you can grow and continue to grow and one of one of my colleagues one of my clients as well dr Eric so good who is uh, an agent for a number of high profile footballers and, and and lots of people around the world is he came up with a great phrase or he told me of a great phrase called, called so basically saying protect the process and i really liked that saying as well which was you know one of my days is all about process 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 it, it yeah. totally process driven but what you need to do is when you start forming habits you need to make those processes sacrosanct you need to make them non negotiable there's definitely going to be days where you don't read as many or you read more or whatever but on the whole you know feeling that you can be in control of your future by networking in the right way by building your knowledge base it becomes very rewarding the process in itself right we're going to talk about the process uh, in, in a bit in a second, actually, there's a, just this question from Rigel Sharda. And in fact, he, you said that being a lawyer helped you uh, progress in the sports industry. What would you recommend to people if they are not, if they don't have a legal background? And my understanding from the talk here, and from your previous videos, is that the advice that you're sharing now, it's, it's not only for lawyers, I think it's for basically everyone, correct? Yeah, exactly. It's easy for me to say in terms of law because that is effectively what I've done. But ultimately, for a range, a huge range of jobs that may um, uh, may be available in sport, the same applies. Um, you have a core set of competencies, a skill set, um, your ability to draft documents, you're available to speak on the phone, your ability to be able to liaise with people, to work in a team, to articulate things well, to communicate to have particular technical skill sets, if that might be in marketing, if that might be in 
artistic design, if that might be in social media posts, whatever it might be across the full spectrum of um, sport, um, sporting jobs and job descriptions. I think then the idea is, is that there's no, there's no inherent need to be in a rush to then get into the industry. And that I think is hopefully a really important message, which is the people that really want to get in the industry need to just show sometimes a little bit of patience and not worry about the short term. Get the job, get the skills, find mentors, find good people, great companies to work with, and then keep your eye out for the jobs that might suit your skills in the medium to long term. Right. Um... Daniel, we're going to talk about uh, one of the things we're going to talk about today is about your book, Done Deal. You you have a copy there, and you offered to give one away to to the people watching. Actually, you have two books to give away. So the first one, we I, I see here that we have uh, almost like forty people watching us at the moment, and there's fifteen likes in our page. If we get to thirty, if we double that, we're going to draw one. Um, Great. One book uh, to give away. And then the second one, actually, people sending questions. I'm going to let you uh, choose to the your favorite question or the, the question that you like the most. Is that okay? Of course. That's cool. So for everyone watching, if you want to you know, enter a draw to win a done deal, a uh, book by um, Daniel G., just uh, hit the like. If we get to 30 likes, then you're gonna get. Uh, we're gonna draw one, and then you have a book uh, by your friend. Do you want to show that again? Of course. So this is um, from um, Dr. Erkut Sogut, who is uh, the agent of Meza Erzil and a number of other high-profile um, footballers. He wrote a brilliant book on how to become um, a football agent. So I'd really recommend this anyway. But I have a copy to be able to uh, give away at the same time. That's great. So, super cool. Uh, then just to, to, to wrap up the, um, your, your episodes and then uh, the last one of your videos when you talk about the, the, when opportunity and preparation meet, right? Some, some call that luck, uh, which is the encounter of uh, opportunity and preparation. Uh, then you talk a lot about uh, the right mindset to, well, to work in the sports industry or, or elsewhere a growth mindset versus a, a fixed mindset. Maybe you want to elaborate on that to our friends watching. That's great. Um, yeah, so I would I would highly recommend, there's a brilliant book um, called Mindset by um, an author called Dr. Carol Dweck. And that's exactly what she talks about to some extent, which is, um, you know, a, a growth mindset is a mindset which is things, um, Things might be difficult, you might suffer setbacks, but you see it as an opportunity to grow, an opportunity to learn, an opportunity to get out of your comfort zone, an opportunity to be able to become better, to literally grow your brain, to be able to um, effectively challenge yourself to greater um, achievements and greater accomplishments. And you know, my view is that there's always luck in this world. I'm not doubting that for, for one second. Sometimes you could be in the right place at the right time. But usually you're in the right place at the right time because you're investing and doing things in particular ways. It might well be some people see luck in terms of um, a person meeting someone at a particular conference, striking up a conversation and being suitably impressed to then offer a job. Now, to the outside, an uninitiated person, someone might say, well, that's just lucky that that person was there and they managed to speak to that person at the right time. And obviously here they are. You know, my view on that is that that's probably nothing further away from luck, potentially, which is if that person who gets that job is in that conference because they're finding ways to be able to network, to grow their relationships, to build relationships. Maybe they've actually been in touch with the PA of this high powered individual to be able to offer the job in the first place. Maybe they've practiced over two or three weeks to pitch to that person in a 30 second elevator pitch why it might be useful. Maybe it might be also because they've developed their knowledge base over the last three or four years to be able to be in a position to talk cogently, authoritatively, knowledgeable, knowledgeably about particular discussion points that that person wants to be able to bring up in conversation. My view is there's lots of things in this world that you can't control, but there's plenty that you can control. And in a way, that's almost my view through that process. 
through that investment in yourself and through that net, those networking techniques, put yourself in the best position that luck finds you that little bit easier. Cool. Um, super cool. We are having some uh, other questions uh, coming. You'll like to hear that some. From when I announced that, so that you're going to give uh, your book away, it went from 15 to 27. So we're three likes short. If people hit that like, we're going to give that one away. But, um, and also, let me ask every, everyone that's watching, uh, watching it, one thing that I would like to know. Uh, you can give your opinion as well, uh, Daniel. How should I actually frame it? this way uh, the big frame or uh, actually the, the close-up frame or a wider frame we've been doing half of this uh, like this i'm going to change it now i want to know how people prefer it so if people can leave a comment uh, on that as well that will be great uh about let's let's talk about your book then um well, it, it, it's a very long title. Well, it's done deal, which uh, became your brand in a way. Yep. And you want to tell, tell us the, the, the full title? I have to read it out. So, yeah, An Insider's Guide to Football Contracts, Multi-Million Pound Transfers and Premier League Big Business. I think it's already explained. Everybody that has no doubt what that's about. So I'm actually going to ask you, about uh, the process. How was the process to, to write the book? I think many people uh, visualize about, you know, I really want to write about something. I have a feeling that it's a Herculean task. It's uh, super difficult to do. You want to share uh, a bit about the process with us? Yeah, I mean, I think like anything, there's a, there's, um, a great book, which I love, um, that uh, a, a, an author and a journalist called Matthew Syed wrote. Um, it's a kid's book, actually, but I've read it quite a few times called You Are Awesome. And he talks a lot about this iceberg effect where, you know, people see the, the glory, the bit at the top, basically, which is only the small bit. And underneath the, the sea, underneath the calmness um, is all of the, the hard work, dedication, rejection, failure, difficulties. I'm not saying it's all necessarily negative, but what I mean is, is that, um, you know, in this world now of perfect Instagram pictures and everybody seeing instant celebrity and stuff. Um, I, I think sometimes it's important just to reiterate that the process isn't particularly easy, but it's, it's worthwhile, I think is the point. Um, and yeah, for me to, to write done deal, it was, um, it was about an 85,000 word um, undertaking. I, I, I just started at Sheridan's, which means I was building a practice there probably working 12 hour days um, pretty constantly and probably even a bit more on weekends. I had uh, a, a two year old and a three month old um, uh, kids as well to help look after along with my wife. Um, and I got the deal um, after I'd written quite a long book proposal and a sample chapter. Um, but, you know, I, after doing some planning with my wife as to how I was going to write this book within two years it turned out that actually i would need to spend around 10 hours a week uh drafting the the book to get to that um to get to everything in and that really worked out as i talked to you in preparation to this um this video um, um interview that um that effectively worked out as four hours on a sunday three hours on a monday three hours on a tuesday for the best part of two and a half years was the truth um and that got me there but there were definite times where I had greater enthusiasm than others. But again, it was just keeping that process, that dedication, keeping on going, even if it wasn't particularly easy. And in the end, it was a, a really fulfilling process. I obviously learned a lot more um, about things. A lot of it was in my head already, but um, it was just great to go through that creative process. And now, you know, um, almost uh, a year and a half on from when it was originally published, it's, it's been great. It sold, uh, I think I'm allowed to say, uh, around 10,000 copies, which has been fantastic um it's just allowed me to be able to come on you know places like this to be able to talk about you know career and book and law related stuff as well and um it's just opened up more opportunities than i would have otherwise had if i you know part of my job as being a lawyer but part of my job is also business development and marketing and bringing new clients in and making a name and showing expertise and, and competence and and the book is um effectively just another tool to be able to do that great 
Um, just to let you know, actually an overwhelming choice pre preference to wider. So we move back to, to, <laughs> to, to the wider view. Uh, let me post um, one question uh, from Rigel. He has been, he or she, sorry, he's been here since the beginning. Um, loved your book and wants to know what kind of impact do you expect in the football business uh, world because of the Qatar 2022 World Cup being in November and December? Could it be compared to the impact of the COVID-19 to an extent? Not an easy, not an easy answer to a really perceptive question, um, which is, you know, Qatar 22 has been known for some time and the international and national fixture calendar has been um, amended and planned um, a significant amount of time in advance. So that has to be uh, a, an advantage because everybody knows what's coming down the track and down the road. The difference with COVID is that we're in such an un unpredictable time um, from a planning perspective. FIFA, UEFA, all the national and international governing bodies and associations are simply unsure about when, uh, on the whole, even though we have Liga starting again, uh, when on the whole sports events can um, continue, uh, restart, and when the season might be able to restart. And, you know, that has huge implications for you know, the, the commercial imperatives of all of the stakeholders. Broadcasters are going to only pay if they receive the services. Um, if they can provide the services from live games. Sponsors and commercial sponsors are only going to be able to activate and pay the money if there are activations um, and engagements that then can happen um, as a result. So um, whilst Qatar, in brief, um, even though is disruptive, has been a planned disruption, um, to yeah. the football calendar, COVID is almost the exact opposite of that. Yeah, totally agree. Um, there's actually two questions here um, about education. Both um, Juan Carlos, is there any course uh, you would recommend for any non-lawyer, for a sport director on sports law? And just to continue that, what specific courses do you guys recommend to start in the sports industry? Uh, talking from a just graduate person viewpoint? It's, it's a really good question. So um, I'm not sure I know the easy answer to it. There's a, there's a number of great courses that I lecture on generally inside and outside of the UK. Um, there's um, Birkbeck, Coventry University, UCFB um, in the UK. There's a number of great courses um, aboard like the IFBI that I've lectured on in the past. And the FBA, for example, that um, are excellent. Everyone's basically an acronym. Um, but also, I, I, if it's of any value as well, I'm not wanting to self-promote anymore. What, what I did just basically as the COVID lockdown started was I actually did a week and a half, two and a half weeks worth of live YouTube on um, uh, the, effectively the legal landscape of the football industry. Um, and um, I called it sort of football industry uncovered. And that was... Um, again, all of those videos are completely free of charge to be able to, to watch on my YouTube um, um, on my YouTube channel. And it goes from things like player contracts and transfers to uh, boot deals to financial fair play and social media, uh, commercial deals um, and other types of elements. So um, hopefully that might be a, a good place to start. But um, yeah, more afterwards, I'm positive I could probably provide just a bit of a list to a few of the um, attendees to be able to, to help. Definitely, yeah. I'm familiar with, I think, all of the, the ones that uh, that you mentioned. Uh, a few of them are actually partners of uh, I Work in Sport, and they come to the events that we organize. We do have a few others. So if you want to check out the, the website, if you go to, to the section of the events, whether it's the I Work in Sport job fair or the virtual job fair, they will be able to see the list of academic partners there. I personally did um, the FIFA Master one which for me was great and 100% um, recommend. But I can say that uh, there are other courses that are also super good. And for instance, the one that, that I did for me was one of the most interesting facts about it was taking place in different uh, countries. So it starts in England, goes to Italy and finishes in, in Switzerland. However, there is, I know 
friends that did different courses exactly because they didn't want to travel and because they wanted just to settle and, and, and have the, those courses. So others, others that I can mention that are our partners that you haven't mentioned before are, is the ASTS uh, here in Lausanne, the Johan Cruyff Institute, the University of Liverpool, uh, there's the EU Business School. Uh, they're all partners of um, I Work in Sports. So if you go to the website, there's going to be a list of them there. And though the, the one that I did, the, the FIFA Master, is a full-time uh, program, a year long, some of these um, institutions that also you mentioned maybe uh, will provide online courses, short-term uh, courses. So, yeah, all, all of these that are mentioned, you can go and take a look at it. Uh, let me ask you about um, continue there's a now questions are really starting to, <laughs> uh, to to come in. People may be joining a, a little late, so they will see the start of the conversation in in, in the rerun. Uh, what about the most exciting legal case that you have dealt with or you were part of? What's the most remarkable that uh, you would you would, yeah you would mention? To be fair, I mean, a lot of the time, uh, it's sometimes difficult to speak about because obviously of confidentiality, um, as you can imagine. Um, but there's two things I'd probably say. The first is there's there's a case that I wasn't involved in that um, uh, certainly became the backbone of a lot of the stuff that I then subsequently was inspired to do. And that was the, the Karen Murphy uh, QC leisure cases, which was... Um, um, the story of a, a pub landlord in uh, Portsmouth who was buying uh, Greek decoders and decoder cards from Greece because the Sky um, um, subscription was too expensive. And there was a whole argument about whether she was entitled to be able to buy those decoder cards because of the free, freedom of movement of goods and services argument whilst uh, the UK was in the, um, the EU. And that brought into play loads of fascinating competition law, free movement, football, copyright, um, trademark issues. And those cases just went on for years and years and years. And that was probably one of the most interesting elements because from my competition law background, from that being one of the sport being in broadcasting, being one of the sectors that I invested a lot of my time in, I felt like I was able to offer some interesting comments. That's how I wrote a lot of my first articles, appeared on TV and different um media outlets etc and i think really the stuff that i'm involved in generally um a lot of the time you know it's difficult sometimes to sit back and smell the roses and um, it, it can be a little bit stressful and um, if you get the right result actually you're just more relieved sometimes more than anything else because um you know your clients will put a lot of faith um uh and confidence in you to be able to get the job done right so the truth is, a lot of the time, there will be times where matters will go to court and arbitration and mediation, um, um, etc. But I actually find the greatest success sometimes, doesn't always happen all the time, the greatest success is actually when things don't go to court because things can be resolved and solved um, without um, a judge uh, and with um, people coming to more pragmatic solutions if there is um, a pragmatic solution to find. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. There is some more legal oriented questions uh, coming in. So here is from Eclipse Trading. Great and, uh, yeah, what impact uh, we can see in the Premier League transfers, particularly in terms of contract transfer laws, transfer fees uh, due to COVID? So the short answer, and do you mind, Joe, if you just keep that up because it was actually quite. Oh, uh, That'll be okay, just because there's a couple of bits there. Great. Um, the short answer is um, for players who are out of contract come the 30th of June, it is an issue, uh, especially in the UK, because whilst FIFA's guidance is um, that ideally um, contracts should be extended until the end of the season, query when the end of the season might actually be, under English and Wales, Welsh law, it is not permit permissible for one side to unilaterally engage another side without the other side's con uh, consent. So in order for a contract to be extended, both parties would have to agree the terms for any extension. Now, um, in terms of transfer laws, 
Um, it's more maybe to do with um, then when the transfer window opens and when a player can potentially be registered. If a player is out of contract and doesn't want to sign a new contract or the club don't want to keep the player on, then there is an issue with out of contract players that aren't going to be able to be registered for new clubs until the transfer window opens. And that transfer window might only open September time, potentially, if the seasons need to be concluded over the summer period. And that's if things go perfectly. The, the wider question, again, about transfer fees, very briefly, is um, dependent. it's very dependent on timing of what is going to happen probably in the next three or four weeks, whether the, some of the big leagues are going to be able to finish their seasons, the Premier League, Serie A, um, and um, uh, La Liga particularly. Um, Germany and Bundesliga have obviously started, Liga and has been um, um, uh, effectively suspended and ended. So whether those broadcasting monies will then flow down, it's obviously not going to be the full amounts, will then very much depend on the budgets that teams across Europe are going to have to be able to pay those transfer fees uh, and whether then they can ex potentially um, take advantage of clubs that have more greater liquidity problems being able to purchase those players for reduced fees because it will likely be a buyer's market. Okay. Um, I know that um, you have an appointment right after this, so I'm going to go probably to just uh, two quick questions, one from me and one from the audience. First, I'm going to say that... That's okay, Joe, 10 minutes or so, if you need to. Yes, um, that'd be brilliant. Uh, so Ines from England, hello Valeria in Lausanne, hello uh, to you too, Kumar is watching from Nepal, so thank you all for watching. There is um, a question from Dimitrios, it's a, it's a good point because you worked in both uh, with sports and before that, so what's the difference that you perceive between previous industry and the sports industry? Although you've been doing a very similar job, right? Um, in law, but now you're, well, if, if you wanted to work in sports, there m must be a, a difference uh, from what you were doing before. So what would you say is, is the main difference of working in sport and working in different industries? It's a bit all encompassing and a bit 24 seven. That's the thing I would say sometimes is that, that that's almost the, um, the playoff. Um, I felt some of the times when I was working across different sectors and you know it could have been in the automotive industry financial services media telco um aviation um they were very much areas that i was interested in but i didn't necessarily have my passion in and so effectively i found that when i could combine my passion but not necessarily just my passion because i like watching football games my passion for understanding the industry for reading the regulations, for understanding how contracts work, for um, understanding how the industry works in practice, not necessarily in theory. That gave me um, that greater understanding to be able to match my underlying knowledge base and my network that was growing with my particular um, uh, growth area into sports. So, you know, I th I, the, the truth is, you know, it's not like I don't hear too many people say I have a real passion for the aviation industry or for the financial services industry to the same extent as when we're talking about entertainment or music or film or sport or esports. So they're the type of things that then make you more passionate about wanting to get into the industry, investing your time to get there and how you go about doing it. Cool. Um, I think one question from me, and people will notice that when they watch your videos on, on career, they're going to go and, and click on the link uh, below and see the, the full thing afterwards. In a few of them, you're wearing a hat that says one plus one equals 13. You know, I Googled it. I found a rap a song and don't really know what that is about. So what, uh, what does that mean? So it's funny you ask. <laughs> so. Um, the short answer is uh, the best part of a year or so ago, just as you can imagine, uh, so you'd imagine is I, you know, I'm not necessarily a typical lawyer that is just at his desk all day long and um, drafting documents. Uh, and so um, as a charity uh, idea that I had, um, and after doing quite a lot of research, I, I thought about starting um, a charity fashion brand um, called 13. So that's where the idea came from. 
It can be uh, a little bit Marmite, i.e. some people like 13, the number, or hate 13. You know, there aren't too many um, hotel floors 13. There aren't necessarily too many seats on planes in rows that are 13, for example, or otherwise. Um, but for me and my family, 13 is quite a lucky number. I always used to wear it as um, a football shirt, for example. Um, I always liked that number. Um, generally, my grandma was born on that date. And so it, in a way, uh, the one plus one thirteen is thirteen is my fashion brand, my charity fashion brand. Um, and feel, please feel free just to go to that site, which is thirteen one three shop dot co dot uk, and all the proceeds go to charity, the cancer charity. Um, but most importantly, for the one plus one equals thirteen, there's a fantastic book by um, an advertising guru called Dave Trot, and he wrote a book called One Plus One Equals Three, which effectively is that the outputs can be greater than the inputs. Um, and that is almost the way that I uh, used then um, the one plus one equals 13, which is ultimately whatever you put in, you want to try and get out more than what you put in. And that is ultimately the value that you can provide. It's the expertise that you can give. Um, and um, it's almost the inspirational message, which is you can get more out of what you do if you want to um, achieve. And so, yeah, a lot of people are sometimes quizzical with my one plus one equals 13, including my daughters, my el my youngest, um, who got asked in school what, what one plus one is. And she said 13, um, right. just couldn't quite understand it. And she was very insistent that one plus one equals 13. So, um, yeah, yeah, I think I'm a bit to blame there, to be honest. So, so again, what's the, the, the website for the, the charity shop? Yeah, so it's 13 shops. So it's one, three, the number's one, three. And then shop s h o p dot co dot u k and we've got some collaborations with Champion the um, sports brand. We've got some cool stuff with American Apparel as well, which is great. Um, and um, yeah, all the proceeds go to um, uh, the cancer research um, uh, for um, a particular doctor that we've worked with. And also, a couple of the T-shirts have some nice messages on. One being one of the messages from the the um, the course, which is. Luck is where preparation uh, meets uh, opportunity. There you go. Now, Daniel, thank you so much. I think it's time for us to give some books away because <laughs> we just passed those uh, 30 uh, likes that um, we, we asked for. There's 33 likes now. So thank right. you, everyone. If you haven't hit the like yet, you can still do so to you know support the show and just to let Daniel know that you, you liked the, the interview and his availability and sharing his knowledge uh, with us. It would be super uh, cool if you did that. Um, so we, let me go to, to the comments here. Uh, so one thing I, I suggest, I did that once before, it worked well. Do you wanna choose uh, a question that you prefer that you would like to give your um, your, your book uh, too, uh, done deal? Yeah, I actually, um, uh, I really like the question on uh, the transfer window impact on transfer fees and um, on player contracts, etc. I thought that was, um, that was a really good one. Is that this one? Eclipse, indeed. Okay, so Eclipse Trading. Uh, see, send an email to info at iworkinsports.com and we'll make sure that um, you you get that one. And uh, I'm going to, here there's loads of comments that came throughout the, the thing. So I'm gonna kind of close my eyes and I'm gonna stop my, my finger here somewhere. And I'm gonna point to Riju Sharda. Uh, what kinds of an impact do you expect to the business of world? So, Rigel, well, that's very cool because he already has your book. So he's uh, someone that likes your book. So very, <laughs> very we'll, give the, we'll give him the formal agent book then. So he'll, get, he'll, get the, he'll get the other one. So uh, let me thank everyone for, for being here, for the, for the messages, for participating from all over the world. Uh, next week, we're going to have a super cool one going to interview a good friend and a mentor, uh, Mr. Patrick Nally, is known as the founding father of sports marketing. So we'll be talking to us and uh, 
yeah, this is um, great. Don't go anywhere, Daniel. Just I'm going to wrap this up and remind people to, if they want to know more information and get in touch with us, just go to iworkandsport.com. If you can do that like, please uh, do that. And uh, so if you want to be reminded about the, the interview with Patrick and everybody else that is coming, uh, hit the bell sign and, and subscribe. This is our uh, social media uh, yeah, channels where, where you find us. We're at I Work and Sport everywhere. So I'm going to end this. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, bye-bye. Thank you.